Today on America's Test Kitchen, we're going back to basics. Bridget makes Julia the ultimate bone-in chicken breast. Adam reveals his winning trash cans to Julia. And Elle shows Bridget the secrets to the very best baked potatoes. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. So there's a guy sitting in a movie theater, and he looks next to him, and he sees a chicken. And he looks at the chicken, and he says, are you a chicken? And the chicken said, well, yes, yes, I am. And he said, well, what are you doing here? And the chicken said, well, I like the book. <laughs> OK, that is one of the worst chicken Aww. jokes I've ever heard. Nice try, though. <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of bad chicken jokes out here. But the worst one is called boneless, skinless chicken breasts. Yeah, they cost more money than bone-in chicken. And they have a lot less flavor. So today, we're going to roast bone-in skin on chicken breasts, and the chicken Here's the good news, it's going to do most, but not all of the work for us. About time. We're mm. using four 10 to 12 ounce breasts. First, I want to trim off any excess fat. Now you can take a knife and remove it, or you can take a pair of kitchen shears, which is a great way, and just kind of take away a little bit of that fat. You don't want to cut too much away because we want that skin to stay on. Now this one, he's got some fat to remove. Right <laughs> there. Join the club, chicken. Exactly. <laughs> So we're just going to give this guy a little cut here. This one looks good, and that one looks good. So we just take our fingers and gently lift up that skin. Now we want to keep it attached to the two ends, and also as much as possible to this rib end, just almost like a pocket. And if you need to, you can always take a pair of scissors, just loosen it a little bit and I'm going to fold this back. Now this is also a good opportunity if we were to find any large pockets of fat underneath, we could just pull them right out. So now we want to sprinkle these with one and a half teaspoons of kosher salt, just much more easy to sprinkle evenly than table salt, which would dissolve very quickly. And if you're using table salt, you'd want to reduce that salt amount by about half. And then I'll go ahead and season the other side as well. And now, Go ahead and replace that skin. So it's not completely detached. I'm going to give this guy a little trim here. There we go. Cover that right back up. And then a little bit more salt right on top. Because you're not going to want to throw away the skin. It's going to be super <laughs> crispy. So we want it to be nice and seasoned. I have to say that crispy chicken skin is one of my favorite parts of the chicken. There is still a little bit of fat underneath the skin. We want that fat to render, so we're going to give it away to melt away from the chicken. So I'm going to take a skewer. You can also use a paring knife. You want to make five or six, even seven, if you're feeling jaunty, <laughs> little holes right in any pockets of fat. That is all the prep that we have to do. Pretty easy. That was it. Yep, that's it. So I'm going to put these on a foil line tray. These are going to go into a pretty low oven, 325 degrees. This meat is very, very lean. So at 325 degrees, it's not going to squeeze out all the excess juices. Also, it's going to dry the skin just a little bit. Then later on, when we do go to sear it, it's going to get nice and crisp. Mm, best part, these will stay in there for 35, 40 minutes until the internal temp reaches 160 degrees. So while the chicken's in the oven, we have time to make a sauce. And chicken mm. breast is still pretty lean, even with that skin on. So it can take a really rich sauce. We're going to make an easy one, though, with mayonnaise as the base. So I've got fresh cilantro. I need about a cup of the leaves and the stems. Just going to roughly chop this. We're going to let the blender do most of the work. Now, the interesting thing about cilantro is that unlike parsley, the stems of cilantro actually taste sweet, so you can include them. But the stems of parsley taste bitter, so never include parsley stems, but always include cilantro stems. All right, so next up, jalapenos. I've already gone ahead and prepped two of them. This is the third. You're bold. No gloves, huh? No gloves. <laughs> if you want to, especially if you wear contact lenses, I would advise people to wear gloves at home. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I like a little paint. <laughs> so I'm going to take my knife, go ahead and stem the jalapeno and then slice it lengthwise. Now most of the heat resides in the ribs and the core. So I'm going to take a little spoon and just scrape that away. So I'm just making matchsticks here. And then I'm just working my knife right across, keeping track of where my little fingers are. And then this goes all into the blender. We have a half cup of regular prepared mayonnaise and 
a tablespoon of lime juice, two minced garlic cloves. That is some serious flavor you're putting in there. I'm not joking. <laughs> this is a serious sauce. <laughs> and a half a teaspoon of salt. We're going to let this go for about a minute until it's pretty darn smooth. So now this is a pretty good sauce, but we want to add a lot more richness. So I'm going to drizzle in two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil as this is running. And the reason you didn't put the olive oil in at the beginning is because when you blend olive oil for far too long, it begins to turn quite bitter. So whenever you're blending something and adding olive oil, always add it at the end. Look how gorgeous this is. That is really pretty. Mm -hmm. Took seconds to make. Now all we have to do is wait on the chicken. Wow, Bridget, you really have done yourself. <laughs> wow, aren't they gorgeous? Not. I guarantee you they're gonna look a lot better and quickly. You've commented on how blonde these are. There's no color on there, but I do need to make sure that they've cooked enough. So I'm looking for about 160 degrees. So these are 160, perfect. So we're ready to cook. Traditionally, we would go ahead and heat up a big skillet, a mm. little bit of oil in there, over high heat, medium high heat. The problem is chicken, especially with skin on chicken, has a little bit of moisture right under that skin. Yeah, you can see it almost glistening there. If that moisture hit that hot oil and that Stand hot pan. Stand back. Exactly, it's splatter city. Mm -hmm. So what I've done here is I've heated our 12 inch skillet over low heat for five minutes. It's a much milder temperature in this pan. I'm gonna go ahead and add one tablespoon of vegetable oil. We'll go swirl this around. Takes a little bit longer when the pan's not quite as hot. There we go. And now I'll add the chicken skin side down right into that pan. Now we shouldn't really hear anything. So that's pretty remarkable. We're browning chicken in a cold pan. Yeah, who'd have thunk it? We're going to crank up the heat to medium high. And now we'll cook these skin side down until that skin gets really nice and crisp. That's gonna take about three to five minutes. All right, let's check out that color. Ooh, now that is some good looking chicken. It's about as sexy as chicken can get, right? <laughs> it is. We do need to cook this a little bit longer. We don't want the skin to get too much more color, so I'm gonna prop them up on the side with the fat end of the meat facing down in the pan, just to give it a little bit more time there. All right, so we're gonna give this another one to two minutes, and then we're gonna put them on the platter. All right, that is it. Let's turn off the heat. Those are some of the most gorgeous pieces of chicken I've ever seen. Who would have thought, right? You know, if you tell somebody you're making chicken breasts for dinner, mm -hmm. they don't expect that. No. These need to sit for about five minutes, and then we're good to eat. Five minutes is finally up. Nice. All right, so it's time. Eating time. That's right. For sauce, I always like to spoon it on the side because that skin is so nice and crispy. Yeah. You don't want to mar it with sauce. It's almost so pretty, I don't want to eat it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what's really surprising is how well seasoned the chicken is because you didn't have to let that salt sit on the chicken for very long. Exactly, just salt it and then right into the oven. But the sauce is really nice. It adds that rich component oh. as well. I'm just gonna have one bite of nothing but chicken skin. It's so decadent. <laughs> so for the best tasting chicken, let the bones and skin do most of the work for you. Sprinkle a little salt underneath the skin for flavor, then use a two-step cooking method that starts in the oven and finishes on the stovetop. From the test kitchen to your kitchen, the best recipe for roasted bone-in chicken breasts. Oscar the Grouch and Adam have one thing in common, and that is they both have strong opinions about trash cans. Well, at least it's not our sunny dispositions you're talking <laughs> about, Julia. We're gonna do some trash talking. There are now garbage cans that you can spend close to $200 on. I know. Gone I've are the seen days those. of a simple trash can. It's crazy. <laughs> and that really got me wondering do you get that much more for that much more money? So we put together a lineup of five different tall kitchen trash cans. The price range was $17.99 to $180. Holy cow. Now, regardless of the price, any trash can should be solid. It should hold a lot of trash. It should have a lid that's wide that opens so you can get trash in there without spilling it. The lid should seal tightly to keep odors in there. 
Those are the basics. Mm -hmm. We did do an odor test, as a matter of fact. You're kidding. What we did is we put in a fresh garbage bag in all of these things. We loaded them up with three peeled, hard-cooked eggs, oh. a cup of chopped raw onions, and an open can of tuna fish, closed the lids, and left for the weekend. Came back to the office on Monday and did a sniff test. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Suffice it to say that not all of the cans passed the sniff <laughs> test. <laughs> Glad I missed that one. Now, for the rest of the testing, what we did is we confirmed that they would hold a 13 gallon trash bag. Mm -hmm. We put in identical assortments of trash. And these things lost points if the bags would slip down, oh. fall off a corner, mm -hmm. if they were difficult to pull out once they were full. Let's talk about how these things open. Now, a lot of times, you're running around in the kitchen, you mm -hmm. have a cutting board in your hands, you're approaching it with a couple of hands filled. Yep. This is a touchless model. Ooh, you don't even cool. need to touch it. It should be great, except that the touchless piece of it, as you can see, was a little erratic. It oh. didn't always work. You really have to approach this thing just right to get it to open. Uh. And you're not always paying attention to that mm -hmm. when you're running around. You know, the first person to pick that up in my house would be my dog. She'd open that thing and her head would be right in it. Get her in here as a new <laughs> tester. I definitely think we want her. Another thing that we didn't like about this one and this one is that it was actually just a small door set into the lid. Ah. So if you're working swiftly, if you have a lot of stuff in your hands and you're not paying close attention, you can end up getting food scraps or trash either on the rim here, on the floor around the can, on the side of the can itself. This one was a nice wide opening. The whole lid Look at that. opened. So it was easy to get the garbage in there. It settled evenly. It didn't pyramid up. If these things pyramid up, you got to go in there and tamp it down so you can fill it to capacity. Mm. And this also looks about the width of a cutting board. So you could almost just lean your whole cutting board there and sweep it all into the garbage. Exactly. Ooh. Good point. That was one of our tests, in fact. Now, we also like the means by which these open. The foot pedal was a lot more reliable than this one, which you had to use your hand for, mm -hmm. than the touchless one, which worked sometimes and didn't work. That was However, pretty smooth. The foot pedal had to be well modulated. Why don't you try that black one there? All right. Oh! See what happens? That. A little extra force sends the lid slamming back Holy into cow. the wall behind the garbage I think I can. broke it. It won't even close now. And that kept happening to us during our <laughs> testing. The top would get a little bit wonky, which is why we like the nice smooth action of this mm -hmm. one. So this rectangular guy was our winner. It was an expensive trash can at $180. Mm -hmm. It's the Simple Human Rectangular Step Can. But you know what? We felt like you got a lot of value from this can. It's the right size, it's the right shape, it's thoughtfully designed, it's got the right kind of lid, it kept odors in. This guy's pretty handsome. I mean, I wouldn't mind having him just out in my kitchen. I'm gonna end up having a little contest with Oscar to see who moves <laughs> into that thing. <laughs> now, if you wanna save a whole bunch of money, this one was a best buy. This is the $17.99 Sterilite Lift Top Waste Basket. It wasn't as heavy, it wasn't as stable, you have to use your hands to open up, but it's a tenth the price Ooh. of our favorite new one. So there you have it. If you're in the market for a new kitchen trash can, consider the Simple Human Rectangular Step Trash Can, or if you want to save a lot of dough, buy the Sterilite Lift Top Waste Basket. America, I know what you're thinking. Do we really need a recipe for baked potatoes? Well, here in the test kitchen, we baked over 200 pounds of spuds to discover that very answer. And today, I'm here with the expert, Elle, who's gonna show us why we do need a recipe. Bridget, some crazy things are happening in the world with baked potatoes, and it has to stop. Oh, no. Immediately. First, we're cooking our potatoes in the microwave. Not good, I've done it. Not good, I've done it too. Right. And it cooks unevenly, it cooks from the inside out. We also cook our potatoes in foil. I've done that too. And it traps in all of the moisture, and it doesn't give us a tasty potato. Mm -mm. And finally, when we do get it in the oven to bake it, we let it hang out on the counter forever, <laughs> and there's no fluffiness coming out of that potato no. at all. But they're great as door stops. Absolutely. <laughs> Today we're gonna to do my favorite thing. One of the things we love to do in the test kitchen, we're gonna brine potatoes. We're gonna brine potatoes. Yes. You said brine potatoes. Okay, now I remember when we started brining beans a few mm -hmm. years ago, yes. and I was a little skeptical about that. It really works though, changes their structure and how they hold on to moisture, much like meat. But now we're brining potatoes. Yes, because not only do we want a delicious potato, we want the skin to be crispy and flavorful. Okay. I like to eat my whole potato. I don't know about you. That's true. That's yeah. true. Yep. Okay. So let's start brining. The first thing we're going to do is poke about six holes in these potatoes. I'll just do two on every side. 
And this is how we get it ready for the brine. Flavor's gonna seep in, steam's gonna seep out. <laughs> so a lot of things are gonna happen. And russets are a perfect choice for baked potatoes because they're one of the highest starch content of all the potatoes. And higher the starch means fluffier potatoes. All right, now that we have our potatoes ready, we're gonna create our brine. So we have half a cup of water here, and we have two tablespoons of salt. We're also brining potatoes because it's very hard to season a potato just normally. The salt will roll right off. If we put it in water, it sticks to the potato. So I'm gonna transfer these potatoes to a wire rack. The wire rack will allow the potato to cook evenly from bottom on all sides and the top. And also it's just easier to get it from the oven. We tested brining these potatoes for up to an hour and we found that just a few seconds in the brine works. So it's more about the skin than going inside the potato. Yes. Gotcha. All right, so now that we have our potatoes brined, we're gonna put them in the oven at 450 degrees. It's very important that we let them cook until they register at 205 degrees internal temperature. And that should take from 45 minutes to an hour. I love this, this is so test kitchen. We're actually looking for an internal temperature of potatoes now. First we brine them, now we temp them. The key to light and fluffy baked potatoes is cooking them to the correct temperature range. Potato starch granules are the largest found in any vegetable, and there are tons of them inside every potato cell. Now, when we heat potatoes, starch granules absorb liquid, swell, and start to gelatinize. Once the temp hits 205 degrees, those granules swell so much that they literally force the potato cells apart, creating the fluffy, light texture we want. As the internal temp approaches 212 degrees, the water in the potato converts to steam and forces the cells farther apart, adding to that fluffy texture. So for the perfect baked potatoes, land them right in that sweet spot of 205 to 212 degrees. Bridget, it's been 45 minutes and our potatoes are ready to pull. They actually look a little frosty. It's like the salt dried on them. You can actually see the salt crust. Yeah, that's going to be delicious later. So we're going to temp our potatoes. Remember, we were looking for an internal temperature of 205. Temping the potato does two things. First, it lets us know that the potato is obviously done. Second, pushing the thermometer in gives you a feel of the resistance. If it slides right in, you know it's ready to go. So we're at temp, and we're going to brush these potatoes with a tablespoon of vegetable oil. This is what's going to give us that nice, crispy skin in the end. We also found out that if we brushed the potatoes with oil prematurely, we got leathery skin. Because if it was put on too soon, the oil would have trapped that moisture in. Absolutely. So gotcha. it would have been kind of chewy on the inside and leathery on the out, just like another potato mistake. <laughs> and one thing you don't want to do, you know, I'm usually a butter advocate. You don't want to brush the baked potatoes with butter. Butter contains moisture, water in fact, and that water will actually sog out the crust. You may, however, if you have some on hand, brush it with a little rendered bacon fat or goose fat or duck fat or any of those fats. So our oven is still at 450 degrees. We're gonna put these back in for 10 minutes just to give it that flash cooking that's gonna give us our crispy skin. Our potatoes only have a few more minutes in the oven. Let's throw together a quick topping to put on them. Fantastic. All right, so we have four ounces of goat cheese that I'm gonna smash up here. We're gonna put in two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil, two tablespoons of parsley, one tablespoon of shallots, and a half a teaspoon of lemon zest. This is my favorite part. You know, I never would have thought of lemon zest on a baked potato, but it makes sense, because roasted potatoes, you add lemon zest to it. Why not a baked potato? Why not baked potatoes? Lemon zest adds a little zing to everything. Finally, we're just gonna season to taste with a little bit of salt and pepper. It's very flavorful, so it doesn't need a lot. Sometimes goat cheese is super salty and sometimes it's not very seasoned at all, so that's a really good idea. Mm-mm. And here's the taste part. Let's make sure it's good to go. Lovely. <laughs> seasoned to L's taste. So that's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I love it even more. That is pretty, too. Okay, I'm gonna go grab these potatoes out of the oven. Oh, look how crisp those skins look. Very different from when they went in. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna tend to these potatoes immediately. We are not going to squeeze them to tell if they're ready because we temp them at 205 degrees. And people think if they leave them here on the counter, these poked holes will let all the steam escape. Those are all false statements. You must attend to them immediately, cutting them open, letting that steam out, and getting your beautiful potato. 
When you cut that open, it sounded like a potato chip. You know it that? It did because it was crispy. So we're just cutting an X across the top. Come on. Oh, give it a little squeeze. You can see all the steam coming out. Can oh, you imagine yeah. if that steam had stayed inside the potato? It has nowhere to escape. It just gets super dense. We got fluffy. You can smell them. We got crispy. We got flavor. Yeah. We got toppings. We've got eat. snacks. Yeah, let's eat. They are gorgeous. Fluffy, fluffy. And I know Elle loves me because she just shoved butter inside that baked potato. <laughs> All right, will you do the honors of the goat cheese? I sure will. Hot, hot. Oh. What does that remind me of? That texture. I mean, it's almost whipped. It's so light and airy. And it's actually soft all the way to the middle. That's impressive. I'm gonna tear a little bit of the skin here. I gotta try a piece. Mmm. Really, really crisp. Very seasoned, too. That was that brine. Who would have thought? What are we gonna brine next, the plates? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Elle, thank you so much. You totally owned baked potatoes today. It was my pleasure. Well, 200 pounds of spuds later, we know the way to foolproof baked potatoes. Hook a few holes in your high starch russet potatoes and dip them in salt water before baking to season the skin. Bake them to 205 degrees, then oil the skins and return them to the oven until super crisp. Finally, cut the potatoes open as soon as they're out of the oven to let excess steam escape. And there you have it, from our test kitchen to your kitchen. Proof that this old dog can learn a new trick or two, the very best baked potatoes. You can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and selected episodes on our website, americastestkitchen.com. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.